you've mentioned optimism there and, and a hope, and there is very much a feeling of that towards the end of the book. If you remove borders, as, as this book does with the doors, there is something slightly absurd about trying to pretend that there are these things of nation-states and, sort of, as you say, the sort of nativism that, that strikes up in people. But are you hopeful that if, maybe not with magic doors, but through the progress of time and through borders uh, and barriers being removed, that, that people will be able to live more cohesively together? Or is, are people always going to revert back to sort of the things that make them feel safe? The things that they recognize? Well, I think human history is um, the unsteady, uh, uncertain, yet nonetheless um, quite noticeable uh, uh, progression towards greater equality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the notion that men and women are equal, that people of different races are equal, that religious and non religious people, gay and straight people are equal, these, um, these expansions of equality tend to occur over time. Um, and, uh, and I think the notion that somebody born in Mogadishu and somebody born in Manchester are equal will also eventually be acknowledged. And they have equal right to live in a safe and prosperous place and really equal right to live anywhere on this planet. Uh, it might be some centuries in the future that we get there. But, uh, but I think that this is not actually a kind of disaster where we have to you know, because we like equality, we sort of have to allow this to occur, but it's really going to be terrible for us. Mm. I think as we begin to expand our belief in that equality, in human equality, um, lots of new things come into, into um, focus. So uh, we will have to think as humanity to tackle climate change. You know, we're going to have to, have to think as humanity to mitigate the consequences of migration. But also we have to think as humanity to regulate technology because um, a nation state based approach to regulating technology always results in a kind of maximalist idea of what technology should do because the nation that decides to go slow on technology will become militarily you know, uh, vulnerable and obsolete uh, very quickly. Mm. Um, so, uh, if we are a bunch of competing nation states uh, threatened by each other, um, we will uh, tend to allow um, technology to unfold in a completely, almost completely unregulated fashion, which is what we're seeing. Um, and that's causing enormous anxiety. And particularly in the coming decades, as we give birth to machines that can learn, and in many senses will be more capable than us at many tasks we used to perform, simultaneously we're going to generate enormous surpluses from these machines. And we're going to have the obliteration of many forms of livelihood that we previously knew. Now, if we are thinking of ourselves as equal and governing ourselves more as human beings, we could take some of that surplus and make life much better for those who are losing their jobs and actually enter into a kind of almost heaven-like future where um, people do not want for food and shelter and basic needs and are able to pursue things that they find to be valuable to themselves. Alternatively, we can stay uh, you know, um, in a world that doesn't accept the equality of people based on where they are from um, and the benefits of this technology can accrue to a handful of trillionaires in California and the rest of us will be unemployed. Mm. Kind of dystopian hell. So, you know, I think each time you expand what equality uh, can do or is, is permitted, all the other equalities benefit. You know, men and women, different racial, races, gay and straight. Each equality expansion helps. So, um, I think that uh, a world which is more equal than this world will also be a world where we are much better able to solve the problems that we face. And I think that as a result of that, what is paradoxically likely to happen is far fewer people will move. Because most people actually want to stay with their loved ones. They don't want to go somewhere else. Um, but our, our world is engineered in such a way that we are, you know, uh, producing uh, uh, you know, carbon dioxide emissions from wealthy countries. Those are obliterating the agricultural regions and coastlines of poorer countries. And, you know, um, but what if we weren't doing things quite this way? Um, what if we were investing in, in places uh, um, because we thought of people as equal? I think that would be a world where there would also be even though the right to migrate would be enormously um, expanded, um, it might be a world where the actual pace of migration was much slower. And, uh, and so 
uh, I think you know if you if you start to imagine along these lines, um, I, what I'm saying may or may not come to pass, and it, 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 it it's not necessarily the only way we could go forward. That's positive, but but I think starting to articulate posit positive visions of the future is essential because at the moment what we're being drowned in is pessimistic visions and those lead almost invariably to reactionary politics of tribes that sort of want to kill each other. So, uh, so, so yes, the novel does hint at an optimistic future and I believe that this optimistic future actually is more likely than not to occur simply because the history of, human, of humanity is not the history of genocides. It is mostly of genocides that did not occur. Mm -hmm. um, so we are struck by the Holocaust and we are struck by you know, what happened to Native American people um, in, uh, in North America, for example, uh, when, when European descended uh, people arrived. But those things are the exception. Most of the time what happens is what happened in Pakistan, which is for thousands of years, lighter skinned people came into an area that was inhabited by darker skinned people. And the result was brown skinned people like me. Uh, they mixed over thousands of years. And I think that's likely to happen in the future as well. But Pakistan, of course, has a, a history of division. It, it exists as a country itself because of being divided, uh, the division of, of religious groups, and then divided again with Bangladesh. And I wondered whether that, that history of division is part of what feeds into a, a book that, that wants to find the hope in a unification again of people coming together to work together. Yeah, very much. I mean, for me, I once asked my grandfather, you know, what was the biggest event of your life? Uh, my grandfather, you know, died a, a little over a decade ago and he was born in the early 20th century. And he um, had grown up in a family um, uh, in rural Punjab and uh, had sold off his family land and gone off to the UK to uh, study engineering and then came back to the British Empire still was, uh, ruled India, uh, then came back and built canals. Um, and uh, in 1947, India and Pakistan were partitioned. At that point, he was a married man with a couple of kids. And so he was alive during the Second World War, and he was arrived during the various India-Pakistan wars, the nuclear weapons tests, and, and the man landing on the moon, humanity landing on the moon. And uh, he said to me that the single event of his life that had been most consequential was partition, mm. the partition of India and Pakistan, because he said two thirds of my neighbors and friends left. Um, and, and I think that, uh, that somebody who spent a lot of time in Pakistan, as I have, um, the, the echoes of partition continue. But I think, you know, like many other major world events, the implications of these echoes is not simply for people who live in Pakistan or in India. We can learn as humanity from these things. Um, and uh, what I have learned in, is that, um, that even if undertaken with the best motives that we should divide and, um, and, fall and you know, form more cohesive, simple entities. Um, I mean, sometimes there's reasons to do this. You, you stop bloodshed by doing it, but um, you must be very careful with that impulse because much more often than not, you wind up triggering a whole series of further fissioning, uh, fissionings and, and a search for purity, which in the end uh, shatters uh, societies. And so uh, when I observe a partition impulse in Britain that we see today, um, I think history is useful. Uh, and already in Britain, the tendency towards purity, you know, um, the way that people who are anti-Brexit are spoken of as traitors, the kind of language that we're using, um, the rise in hate speech and, and racist uh, violence. These are things we've seen in other places like Pakistan. And so for me, Pakistan is, um, has lessons you know, for the rest of the world. And, and this novel is about some of those lessons.